Now I would like to introduce my colleague, Dan Alpert, Program Director and Publisher here at Corwin, and he will introduce today's presenters. Thank you, Sharon. So I've been given the task of, of introducing today's presenters. And um, actually, it's quite a challenge because if I were to tout all of their accomplishments, I would use up all of our time. So what I'm going to give you is a Cliff Notes version, um, starting with Debbie Zakarian. Debbie consults nationally on supporting culturally and linguistically diverse students. Her focus includes strengths-based leadership, instructional practices, school family community partnerships, and trauma-informed practice. On to Margarita Calderon. She's probably best known as the developer of EXCEL, which stands for Expediting Comprehension for English Language Learners, a comprehensive evidence-based professional learning program that has been implemented in schools and districts around the country. But Margarita wears many different hats, including consulting for the DOJ, Office of Civil Rights, authoring many books, articles, and research papers, and is Professor Emerita at Johns Hopkins University. Last but not least, Margot Gottlieb is the co-founder and lead developer for WIDA, and one of the world's leading authorities on assessing multilingual learners. Margot is a true visionary who is on top of every major development, promising practice and trend in our field. If I want to know what's going on, Margot is the first person I call. All three of these authors are fierce advocates for multilingual learners and other underserved populations. They are my authors, teachers, and cherished friends, and I feel blessed to know them. On with the show. Thanks, Sharon, and thanks so much, Dan. And hi, everyone. I'm Debbie Zakarian, and I'm delighted to be here with Margarita and Margot. We're de very delighted to be with you, and welcome. We're here to talk about crises, large and small. And after all, they're not new, nor are the inequities that many multilingual learners have experienced for years. Moving beyond crises, that is whatever they are and wherever these occur, help us to envision a better world where we all work in close partnership with each other to ensure that our multilingual students grow into their best selves. And what a perfect time for a book on this topic. Think about the Haitians seeking refuge at our border or the border of the United States, the many fires on the West Coast, the hurricanes, tremendous heat waves, and more, especially the floods that have occurred. Well, as we all imagine the crisis that we've experienced and perhaps will experience in the future, think about what are we doing or we might do to overcome these, to move beyond crisis. Let's begin this discussion with talk of a specific student, Alvaro. Here's a student, Alvaro, a middle school student. In the fall of 2019, he came to the US from Guatemala with his mom and sister after having experienced the tragedy and terror of Volcano de Fuego the year prior. How might you feel as a student like Alvaro leaving your homeland after experiencing the terror and trauma of losing your father and your sister in the trauma of the volcano. And you come to the United States with your mom and your younger sister. And as you imagine yourself as this family, as Alvaro's family, respond to this question in the chat box. What would you want your local community to do so that you feel safe and supported and are a valued member of your community. So just write a few ideas in the chat box and think about what would you like your community to do, that is your local community, to help you, like we would want Alvaro, to feel safe, welcomed, and a contributing member of your community. 
That's what we're going to talk about today. Here's Alvaro. And let's have a look at his family. Here's Alvaro with his sister Inez and his mom, Mrs. Perez. The elongated COVID crisis that we're all experiencing, as well as all of the crises that we've experienced, like the ones I mentioned, and also civil unrest that's been uh, in, uh, happening in our country. Whatever these crises are, and wherever these occur, they can be an incredible opportunity for imagining what can and is being done when we really work together by being in it together, being partners together. Like the high school principal who began this school year by rebuilding a sense of community with, his stu with the students in his school, their families, and the staff. Like the teacher who's meeting with families by phone, online, and using WhatsApp to learn about the activities that they enjoy doing with their children. Educators like these are doing this because they care for their students and they know how much caring means. Whatever the crises, we learn so much when we band together because we've learned that we're not silos unto ourselves. We're part of a larger whole that's interconnected and interdependent like the circles here of our communities, schools, and classrooms. These hold great power and help us to truly overcome inequities when we work as one large ecosystem. That is when multilingual learners, including Alvaro, his little sister Inez, and their mom, Mrs. Perez, work together with us as partners. So let's look at what, our, what we mean. In our book, we talk about how trees communicate. While they occupy a vast amount of geography of our earth, they need air, water, and the sun to grow. They also exist cooperatively and have incredible ways for communicating below ground. While all of these characteristics about trees are important to consider, every tree also needs an additional element that is a sustainable ecosystem, not just to survive, but to flourish. The same holds true for every one of our students. That is, we don't want them to get by just by surviving a crisis such as the pandemic that we've been experiencing or whatever the crises might be. We want them to be successful in school and in their lives. That takes all of us working together, just as trees in the forest do. We describe these three as interdependent and forming one ecosystem that happens only when we use a particular approach. In our book, what we also talk about is some of the research on multilingual learners and others. And for years, the fields of psychology, psychiatry, and social work asked us to look at what was wrong, like the pieces of broken glass here on the left. That is, when we looked at people as perceived broken pieces of glass, we looked at that to treat the problem and figure out what was wrong. What was wrong. That, in other words, we looked at people as broken pieces of glass, and we looked at how we could put them together again. And the field of education drew heavily from this broken glass framework. Focusing on what was wrong, like educators lamenting that their students don't speak English, or that their parents are too busy to help us, helped us only use a deficit-based approach. Since the 90s, the field has of uh, multilingual education, as well as education in general, has greatly changed. We began looking at and really focusing on what are the strengths and assets of our students and families. There's very promising news in the research, and that is when we take time to look at students and their family strengths, we have a much better chance of helping them flourish in school and beyond and to be the unique mosaic that they are. So what does that look like? And what kinds of things do we need to think about? We've all had to make adjustments and still being the amazing teachers we are, 
we're still making adjustments. The big question is how do we do this to move beyond crises in ways that we can help our, the strengths of our students, their families, and even our own strengths to build on these so that students such as Alvaro, his sister Inez, and his mom can succeed to be the best version of themselves. So if we look at this closely, what we're learning more and more is that interactions and lots of them really help students to succeed. I mean, after all, if we look at a child's development, what we see is when a child is born, the first person they interact with are their parents. They form the beautiful parent-child bond of the, of the, of with their child. And then as the child grows, they get to know their family community, such as their neighbors, the markets they shop in, the doctors they see and so forth, the libraries they go to and so forth. And then they come to us, their school community. And whether parents are single parents, two parents, grandparents, or other caregivers, it's these rich interactions that they expect us to have as they've had with their children. A child's development is very dependent on these circles of interactions as much as the interactions that they have with their local community and beyond. In our book, we look at these circles of interactions as being key to supporting students to move beyond crises. That is interactions and lots of them. So let's look at this. Let's look at a typical child growing up and that concept of interactions and lots of them. Most children engage in so many rich interactions that support their health and well being, that support them engaging in activities after school and out of school, and also engaging in school and classroom based activities where their families are involved, where their communities are involved, and so forth. Like the health and well being activity of parents taking their child to their local pediatrician for a checkup like kids who play soccer after school. Like the time my husband, who's an entomologist, came to our daughter's classroom to share the life cycle of monarch butterflies. All of these types of activities reflect what we want parents to do to support their children. Now let's talk about multilingual learners. In the chat box, what kinds of things are you doing not just as parents, but as educators, what types of things are we all doing to create that one ecosystem to support multilingual learners and their families to be involved with us? Please write your responses to this question in the chat box. So as we think about the importance of being one ecosystem where children have interactions and lots of them, how can we build systems where multilingual students are fully engaged in health and well being after and out of school and in classroom based activities. Write your ideas in the chat box. One of you writes getting them involved in sports, absolutely. You, we're, we're all uh, chiming in so quickly. It's hard to follow what everyone is saying, but there are many ideas for helping our students get involved and helping parents be involved. But one thing that we've learned is that in order to help this happen, we have to really think carefully about how we can empower multilingual learners, not just to be participants, but to be active contributing participants. For example, using a strength-based approach I'd like to share with you one of the um, wonderful activities about, that one school is doing to empower its students. So it's not just getting students involved in health and well being after and out of school in classroom based activities, it's also how what kinds of activities we're doing to truly empower students. And Brockton High School in Brockton, Massachusetts is a great example. As the city has become more and more diverse, the need for medical interpreters and translations has grown. In response, Brockton High School 
implemented a medical interpretation and certification program where medical multi where I'm sorry multilingual multicultural Spanish speaking students from Haiti and Cape Verde among others participate in a two-year program of study and intern at a neighborhood health center their senior year. Brockton Neighborhood Health Center indeed has hired many of the graduates of this certification program as full-time medical interpreters. So think about this. Imagine building programming and activities where students' deep cultural and linguistic assets are not just honored, they're treasured far beyond the classroom and help us all overcome inequities. So one of the ways to do this are examples such as Brockton exemplify that interdependent, interconnected effort that's possible by having a point person or team to bring family, school, and local communities together. They work together, this team or uh, person, to really help identify the strengths and assets of families, local communities, classroom and our school district to bring together that concept of identifying strengths to move beyond crises. So here are three important ideas as we think about doing this. First, create an asset-based team that's strength-based where a school can help identify members to build that family and community partnership. Second, meet with the team to identify the needs and desires of our multilingual learners, just like Brockton did and is. In fact, Brockton is looking into having a legal interpretation program for students that are interested in entering a legal profession, and that too will help support the community. Third, build asset-based partners who truly understand the importance of acknowledging and valuing students and families and their own assets. Real partnerships are at the heart of moving beyond crisis. Now we're going to turn to colleague Margarita, who will speak to the second of our ecosystem, the school. Margarita? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. And once more, welcome to our session. And we're delighted uh, to see all your comments. Um, we'll try to get to some of these uh, as often as we can. Uh, but let me share some thoughts about schools. So we're moving into schools. What can schools do as, as a whole, as a complete school? So the first thing is to provide a whole school commitment to multilingual learners by offering whole school PD only on multilingual instruction, on multilingual um, success, uh, achievement, uh, everything that we need to know about multilingual students. And um, an extensive professional development program, not just a one shot or one hour, but rather starting out with maybe three days with follow-up um, sessions, refresher sessions, and a lot of coaching in between. And for that, we need the administrators. And so administrators also play a major role. Their major role is to make sure that all of the things that everyone is learning through professional development is implemented. If it's going to work, it needs to be implemented with frequency and fidelity and creativity. And the administrators ought to attend the PD with the teachers so that they know what is happening in the classrooms. They know how to observe, how to give feedback, how to see if students uh, are learning and how much they are actually learning. Uh, but their major role is to sustain the quality. 
the quality of implementation to make sure that the school is not just trying to meet compliance, but rather that it's moving from compliance to excellence. And one of the major pieces is for them to also attend maybe a follow-up two-day session on how do we support teachers? You know, teachers are going through as much anxiety and, and even trauma, uh, all these experiences uh, that their students are also going through. And so they need a lot of support. And if the principals can map out a support system for the whole year with the caveat that there'll be a couple of detours and bumps in the road and maybe some exits, but it is critical that they focus on the teacher's well being in order for the teachers to also address their students. Oh my God. And uh, in addition to the teacher's well being, also what we need is to provide the type of instruction that integrates the language, the literacy, and the content that the students are going to be learning. Uh, and um, we, we know that vocabulary has become very important in many programs in many schools, but vocabulary is only a precursor into reading comprehension, into academic type writing. So the three components, three basic components need something else. And uh, that something else is a little bit of oil that's going to make these spokes continue to turn. And that oil is uh, social emotional learning that is integrated throughout all the activities, all the components in every classroom, but integrated not just something that happens at the beginning of, of a, a class or at the end of class, but rather it goes through all subjects so that the students really learn those competencies. We know that vocabulary is important, yes, and it's important to teach before the students read or before they see a web, uh, uh, they view a webinar or a video because vocabulary correlates with reading comprehension and also with academic writing, as I mentioned, but it also correlates with procedural knowledge, that metacognitive knowledge, knowing how to learn, knowing also how to approach a content that they might not have experienced uh, previously. And so it's important for the, the teachers to follow this trend that goes from vocabulary to knowledge because knowledge of course will correlate with academic success when they pass those tests. But we know that comprehension depends on knowing between 90 to 95% of the words on a page, in a book, a novel, a trade book, in a paragraph, even in a sentence and really important, on a test question, because if they don't know 90 to 95% of the words in a test question, if they have learned all about democracy, or maybe the test question has to do with biology, maybe the osmosis, the key words, those that are most important, are surrounded by all these other words, all these other phrases. And those are the ones that our multilingual learners need to learn, not just that key word that has to do 
uh, with content that is content specific, but rather every single word and phrase that is nesting that particular contest. And um, it, it means that we must provide explicit instruction, not just exposure to as much vocabulary as possible. In addition to teaching vocabulary for academic purposes, we need to simultaneously be thinking about the language that students need to express their, all their needs, all their emotional challenges, uh, the stress that they're feeling now, perhaps post traumatic stress disorder. Uh, it, we may pick that up by certain um, actions. Uh, are they easily startled? Is there a lack of sleep? Uh, do you find that the student all of a sudden is easily angered or disruptive? Do they have the language to express how they're feeling, what they need? And as we think of the students that are coming now um, that are on the border and uh, they've been stuck there for such a long time, when they come, uh, how are we going to know if they need glasses? or hearing aids. Perhaps, you know, we have so many students coming from the Middle East and Haitian and so many other places now that perhaps have not been to an optometrist or, or a physician recently. And these are the things that we need to look out for. So could you please write in the chat box what else have you discovered about your recent uh, arrivals? What are some things that they might be needing that the kind of language that they need to tell us that they actually need this? And would you um, just type in the chat box and we're going to try to capture some of those and uh, sh uh, share them with you. Uh, yes, the language of technology, for sure. Yes, um, so important. Uh, they need general conversation strategies, uh-huh, and um, the language, how to cope with the new climate, that's for sure. It's gonna be very different from what they're used to. And there's so much trauma, Cultural, uh, yes, dissonance. Uh, there we go again with technology. Google, yeah, I had to learn all that <laughs> myself. Uh, what do they need to survive? Uh huh. And what if they're homeless? How can how can they tell us why they didn't do homework? Why they can't do something? Why they're falling asleep in class? Uh, opportunities for social discourse, the behavioral norms. Yes, many students, uh, they, uh, they, it's not that they're misbehaving, it's just that nobody has told them how to behave. Uh, sometimes, you know, students don't even understand that they have to sit in chairs when they come into a classroom. Uh, physical issues for sure. So, so many things, so many things that are basic. And if we can just uh, think about all these things and uh, ask your colleagues as well, when you go back to school, uh, what have they found? What are they finding? And how do we go about um, providing the type of language, simple language, but nevertheless, the language that will help them through all these stress, stressful situations. And the other thing that we could do for our students is to uh, look at the differences of our students. Uh, how many are SIFE, students with interrupted formal education? Uh, these are newcomers, but uh, the years of experiences of education vary. And uh, we can't do a one size fits all education anymore. We really need to focus on what does this newcomer need versus this other one who has been highly schooled? Uh, but what about the students that have been here since kindergarten? And 
are still not passing the reading exams and not doing well in writing. Here we see a picture of Lisa Tartaglia uh, from Loudoun County. She's a wonderful ESL teacher. And here she's teaching about racial sanation to, um, to her newcomers uh, who are a level two now. But um, she, not only is she meticulous about teaching how to edit their work, but she is also uh, focusing on the multiple interventions that the whole school can provide for the students. How teachers, every teacher can become a mediator of the students' well being. And she says that her primary role is to be a cheerleader and to help the students uh, get into music, uh, after school activities. To, um, she says sometimes she even calls a student who works very late at night. So she calls him in the morning to wake him up just to make sure that he gets to school. And so we have to go above and beyond uh, in what we're doing now as teachers. Yeah, yeah, COVID-19 has caused all these things. And the one thing that we've seen uh, that's perhaps, uh, you know, more positive is that co-teaching has emerged in a more equitable way, that ESL teachers, core content teachers are working together very nicely, doing turn-taking, um, both of them teaching language through different parts of a lesson, both of them monitoring. And so we want uh, things like this, the strategy such as this to continue. And so one of the things that I think we should keep in mind is that um, we need an equity focused school system, the whole school. Uh, we're not talking just about ESL teachers, co-teachers, no. The whole school needs to set high expectations for everyone, for the, the teachers, for the administrator, administrators and all. And it should provide resources that are needed for meeting those expectations. For instance, uh, families, uh, teachers, students, it must ensure an action when any school or any group of students is falling through the cracks. And the good news about this is that now ESSER provides tons of money to do this. Uh, ESSER, as um, many of you probably already know, uh, is a new funding and it's actually the, um, uh, it's the elementary and secondary school emergency, uh, American Rescue Plan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, CARE Act. Uh, it comes under all these different titles, but just going to the Ed, um, Department of Education uh, site, then uh, you can find this. But what it typically says, and I'm going to read a couple of things here, is that it provides mental health services and supports for students and their families and teachers. Yes, and teachers. It provides professional development and training that increases awareness of mental health literacy for teachers and staff, addresses the academic impact of lost in instructional time through the impl implementation of evidence-based interventions. Great opportunity to bring in all these evidence-based interventions uh, that um, uh, funding to respond to students' social, emotional, mental health, and academic needs, integrated. And it addresses the disproportionate impact of COVID, as some of you said, on students from low economic backgrounds, students of color, students with disabilities, and 
multilingual learners, migratory students, and students experiencing homelessness, and children and youth in foster care. So it covers everyone. As advocates of multilingual learners, it behooves us now to make sure that our schools, our districts, our states are using this funding appropriately uh, for our multilingual learners and uh, the teachers with our multilingual learners. So if we think of our collective goal, um, first thing to do is to learn more about our students and then to promote more student-teacher interaction, student-student interaction. And uh, you'll hear more about this uh, later on. Also to learn strategies that build the multilingual learner success in school and beyond, as Debbie has indicated. It's not just during the day, but beyond the day. And coming back to our, our teachers, this is what some of the teachers do and they share. And it's important for us to also acknowledge what are the successes that we're having now? It's important to concentrate on that. We're, you're all having successes. So keep those in mind. And then what are your plans to build on those successes already? And yes, we all have fears. So let's just spell them out. But then what are our strategies to overcome them? And after this year and during this year, all these uncertain times, it is also time to honor all educators, families, uh, to acknowledge how essential our schools are how much our students actually missed us. They love us and we love them back. We love to see them back. And it's, it's time to celebrate. We need to celebrate, move forward by celebrating and showing more effort and, and lots and lots of love, love in the school to sustain us all. And so to end the school section, um, I want you to think about uh, two of your students. Perhaps one is that beautiful, wonderful, bright student who you love and so put their face on one side. But on the other side, think of that student that, oh, I wish, I wish, I wish. This is the student you're wishing you could really get through to them. So put their face right there and keep them in your heart, keep them in your mind. And um, uh, you'll see great results by the end of the year. But let's now get to uh, the nitty gritty of the school, the classroom level. What do we do at the classroom level? And Margot will share that. Hi, everyone. Well, I'm the last of the trio, I'm Margot Gottlieb. And what I think is so interesting is that many of you have heard of flipped classrooms, but what we try to use uh, in beyond crises is to look at flipped contexts for learning. And in fact, using communities and the home as the stimuli for classroom learning. And so that's why classrooms are last. Not that they're last, but that they play an equal role and are pivotal in understanding students in the relationships with families and how families can interact with schools. So if you look at it, what we're trying to do is in revisiting this ecosystem, um, we see a confluence of communities, schools, and classrooms. And I think that this last year and a half has really opened our collective eyes um, to the merging, as Debbie said, is these tr three very interdependent um, communities in the face of crises. And how, in fact, this codependence that each of us 
partakes in is an entree for tackling linguistic and cultural inequities. That's what we've tried to do. And more than anything else, I would consider um, a positive outcome of these crises that we've all endured um, can in, in fact help motivate our multilingual learners along with their family members because everyone has been impacted. And in fact, we have undergone a humanization of education, understanding that our students, families, and, and local communities are the root of learning. And they bring so many of these strengths to our schools and classrooms. So let's look at Ines. Ines is Alberto's sister. Ines happens to be a second grader in the school. She's very talented and she's taken the initiative over the year, um, being facilitated by her teacher um, to investigate varieties of plants and trees going out in the neighborhood, looking and, and perceiving different types and shapes of buildings. And then lastly, she's been asked to log her language use, um, that which she hears um, in different contexts and settings across the community, as well as entering in stores. And so what we have here is a young child, just seven years old, who's exploring her community, but she's seeing it through the lens of learning, that is how science and math and social studies have come to life for her because she's been living it. And all the while she's engaging in gaining literacy in a very naturalistic way. And so it's really important that she is able to bring this learning to school and that her teachers can leverage it as, um, a springboard to further her learning. So let's meet her teacher. Here is Mrs. Ortega Miller. Um, she's a expert second grade teacher. She happens to be bilingual, which is wonderful, <laughs> but she, she is looking at the assets of each and every one of her students. In this case, we're, we're looking at Ines. Um, what, whether these children are in person, whether they're in a hybrid situation, whether they are in remote learning, um, teachers have a tremendous amount of responsibility and we're aware of that. Some of you mentioned in the chat before that um, each of us has become more advanced learners of technology over the last year and a half. Um, and in that way, we've been able to promote student learning, um, giving them new tools such as Padlet or even Seesaw um, and how that can be a stimulus for learning. Even among seven-year-olds, you can put them in breakout rooms and let them think about how to showcase their interests um, in their little group, how they might describe their favorite leaf or their flower, or think about how, how where they found it in the neighborhood. And what did it say if there was a sign above it or not? Um, it, it's just very um, interesting to see seven-year-olds interact with each other. And when they're excited about learning, how they can dive deeply into a topic that they're passionate about. And that's the role of teachers, more of a facilitator and a guide than being um, uh, an instructor of you know, knowledge and skills. So let's go look at a couple of other children in our classroom. Uh, a typical classroom, in this one, there was 27 unique little superheroes. Um, each one brings um, very specific linguistic and cultural portraits. And again, teachers have to think about how can I draw upon each of their families um, the strengths that these families have and use that as um, a way of leveraging each child's learning to, to bring out these strengths in the child, um, to look at the family's um, expertise, to use those resources to make each and every child feel safe 
feel cared for. Um, as some of you had mentioned in the chat before, we want to listen to the each and every child's stories. It's so critical that we get to know these children and that um, we can empathize with them and bring in their lived experiences into each and every classroom. So how might we do this? Well, here you are, the frenzied teacher or educator. Um, how do you even begin to start to untangle this web of inequities that exists um, outside the classroom? Um, there's so many demands that are being placed on you, but one easy strategy that, that you can use is always think about using affirmative language. Think about your words, think about the discourse of your classroom. Think about the pact that you're making with your students. What policies are you bringing? So think about lots of different things. And, and as Margarita said, and, and before I go to this next slide, um, understanding the social emotional learning is part of a child's development alongside their language and conceptual development. And I think again, the, the, the pandemic has really, and other crises has helped to um, exacerbate um, this notion that um, students need to be felt wanted um, and feeling wanted and confident will give them motivation to learn more. So let's look at this one quick chat. Um, I want you to think about some of the positive things you're already doing. Um, think about multilingual learners and how they're able to express their thoughts, their feelings, their ideas. Um, those children, Mrs. Ortega Miller's classroom are in yours. Um, what might be missed if you don't capture and capitalize on the strengths of these students? What's one thing that you could do or that Mrs. Ortega Miller can do? Um, we just have a couple of minutes, but if you wanna jot something down in the chat, that would be great. I like the idea of using a buddy, absolutely. A buddy of the same partner language. So both children can learn um, through language um, that they're most comfortable doing. Um, help supporting classmates, word walls, phrase walls, sentence walls, um, sharing pictures. It doesn't always have to be text dependent. Think about that. Someone just mentioned picture cards, um, thinking about, and, and sharing this notion of the, the cultural uh, classroom um, and how you can think about the microcosm that your classroom is a reflection of your community and how our students should be very proud of who they are and where they live. So let's go to the next slide because time is a ticking. <laughs> Here I want you to think about what we can do by having our students gain multiple awarenesses. That is what is needed to help shape their identities. So when students have opportunity to reflect on their own thought processes, they're building a, um, a foundation for who they are. They're being able to connect to their background knowledge in seeking new information. So you might ask the children, what do you already know about this topic? What are you interested in? What is there in your home or in your community related to this topic? Um, how do you celebrate this topic with your family? What do you understand? What more do you wanna learn? Metalinguistic and metacultural awareness merge in helping to shape the identities of our multilingual learners. So it's metalinguistic sensitivity that really allow our multilingual learners to see the links between or among their languages and their dialects. Um, they get to envision how language is being used for multiple purposes and for different audiences. With metacultural awareness, 
Um, we're enabling our multilingual learners to gain those multiple perspectives and to be able to use them and to have a better understanding of their place in the world and how they can contribute. One thing that we speak of in the book, um, especially at a classroom level, but think about it even at a school level, is how our multilingual learners can become agents of their own learning. Um, here's just nine different different ways in which students can start to feel valued. They can be secure in taking risks. Um, and in doing that, they are seeking independence. They're starting to become autonomous learners. They're beginning to take steps or initiatives um, in becoming their own selves. And so for me, uh, if I look at this little list of nine, offering students choice and voice within your classroom, um, capitalizing on the, the shared experiences that you have as a community of learners, but also bringing in that community, bringing in their home, understanding that there may be trauma, that the, every child has really undergone tremendous um, uh, well, I can't even express myself right now. Um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna say trauma again, um, because it, it's just so prevalent. But we want our students to feel secure in being able to express themselves in one or more languages, whether you know those languages or not, because that's who our children are. So let's look at three quick ideas um, and how we can promote this children agency. First of all, um, we want to be able to create learning opportunities, offer our children time to interact with each other because they're going to be able to learn from each other. Easy as that. Uh, also ask them to explore their interests with their peers, to contribute to um, formulating essential questions, let's say, for a unit of learning. So with teacher as a facilitator, looking at number two, how might you co-construct or co-design integrated learning targets? That is, not look at language and content separately, but as a fusion, as a way of generating um, learning through language um, that's based in content. And then finally, let's have our children take ownership of their own learning. Let them have um, options for contributing to classroom decision-making. Um, the child is the heart of the teaching and learning process. So looking at this a little more closely, the first one in creating these learning opportunities, again, go back to thinking about how each child is bringing their own set of assets. Each child is that super child. Each child is coming with their own wants and desires. Each child has a different language and cultural portrait. And, and so you as a teacher have to think about how can I bring out the best of my children? How can I think about their interests, their passions, no matter what the subject area, how can I always relate to their strengths? How can I help them um, in everything they do? If you look at the next one, here we have Ines and, and Mrs. Ortega Miller um, who are working together. Um, they're co-designing these integrated targets. They're combining language and content expectations. So together, Ines and her teacher can generate options for showing their evidence of learning. So for example, you might say, um, we know that Ines is very interested in nature. She was out looking at you know, the trees and plants. So maybe Ines can identify three dimensional shapes of objects in her house that resemble these leaves, explain how to use them or how to make something from them. So she's going into deep thinking um, that's combining the language with the content. And then finally, um, what's so critical with multilingual learners is that they can't solely rely on text. If you move to the next slide, you can take a peek. There you go. 
um, but in fact, show their evidence of learner through multiple modalities. There's so many different ways. Again, if we, we center on the student's interests and what they are good at doing to start, to start there and then bringing in um, other modalities so they can be successful. Here you see again, um, not only the visual and the auditory, which is so much language contingent, but how can you and the literacy, but the whole kinesthetics of learning, having the ch children um, do reenactments or um, when they're singing a song to have gestures to go with it if you're working with young, young children or even the kinesthetics by creating multimedia presentations that are, move, are moving or eye movies. There's just so much um, that multilingual learners are capable of doing as all other children. So we're gonna leave you today, cause it's almost time, <laughs> um, making sure that you're connecting your student learning to what they already know. And that is their languages their cultures, and their traditions that they bring to school from the community and from their homes. And so in today's world, let's remember we're more dependent than ever on each other. And when we're working with our multilingual learners and their families, that means we also have to embrace their languages and their cultures um, because that's what community is all about. And we are an ecosystem consisting of three interdependent communities. So hopefully you educators who we've addressed today um, can see that by transforming education through our students, that in some small way, we're able to be much more inclusive and that we're able to form partnerships to showcase our students and our families, linguistic and cultural assets. And so we don't have much time. So Sharon, da 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 da. Here's our contact information. Um, we all like to do a lot of professional learning, and we hope that in using the book, you will see um, how we have each interwoven this ecosystem to make education whole again.